in the uh, 1st of December, said we'll go into test 1st of March and we'll ship 1st of April. Who signs up for that? And they were going around the table and everyone was sitting, raising their hands. They got to me and I said, no. I said, we don't have an architecture. <laughs> I said, we don't know what we're building. I said, we are using, as, as per some of the comments here, <clears throat> Anyone ever actually heard of ASN.1? Hey, someone has. This is a very obscure network management programming language, okay? <clears throat> no one in Eric had ever used it before. The developers who were going to work on this had been sent to a one week training, and they were using a 1.0 release of the development environment from IBM, an IBM workstation. So it was a brand new development environment release. First time it had been released. Uh, no one knew the language. No one had ever shipped anything in it. And uh, I'm saying, this is, this, this is a train wreck. <laughs> and I went back to my desk and I wrote a memo and identified what I saw as 13 major risks on this project and said, here are the risks and here are the consequences. And the, I, you know, I'm there as a consultant when I play. The VP over the division, they said, literally, shut up an architect. <laughs> so we didn't hire you to do this, we hired you to be a chief architect. Now, me being me, <laughs> about, uh, that was 1st of November, uh, about, mid-January, I dug out that memo and resent it to all the same people, which was all of upper management, pointing out that 12 of the 13 risks I had identified had come to pass, and the project was slipping badly. Uh, in April, they let me go. I had a final lunch with the VP. It was a good lunch, annual, with the VP of development, and you know, we talked, he said, you know, I, I know we've butted head some, but, you know, what, 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 what's your best feedback to us? I said, you should have listened to me, because when you told the customer that this was a schedule you could do against everything I pointed out, I said, you're going to end up looking one of two things, either dishonest or stupid. Actually, dishonest or incompetent is what I said. Uh, at that point, the project had slipped a full month. I left, it slipped, and it slipped again, where they're now looking at code complete by September, and finally the, the customer came back and canceled the whole thing because there was no progress being made. It was all perfectly avoidable. The risks were all well known. Uh, but you'll run into situations where you'll be told, no, no, we're just going to go ahead. Stop telling us this bad news. We'll talk about that too, yes. Um, I don't know how to frame this question. I consider you very successful. First of all, let me preface that. Um, do you feel like going against what you, you had this feeling that, you know, it's not going to work, um, at least not on the time frame they're saying. Were you at least afraid a little bit to say, this could soil my reputation because I am a chief architect at a project that I think is projected right now to fail? Oh, heavens no. Okay. No. For two reasons. One, I was a consultant. I was an employee, so I had less at risk. Uh, this gets back to the comment I made a week or two ago. Uh, maybe, maybe I didn't make it in here yet. So, someone I, I, I've taken recently to answering questions on Quora. Uh, and someone said, what's the best career advice you ever received? And I said, there was a software development conference I attended back in the 90s. And there was a session, one of the sessions I attended was how to affect change in your organization. And I need to go through my files and see if I still have the, the stuff from the because the, the author was pretty well known for writing in software circles at the time. For life, I can't remember his name. But he said something that struck me like a thunderbolt. He said, the only way you can affect change in your organization is to go in every day prepared to be fired. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, he's right. And that's terrifying, because often you can't afford to be fired. <laughs> Which means you have to live with how the organization is, or find another job. Yes? So what do you mean going there, like, prepared to be fired? Like, prepared to, like, do something risky, or prepared to work your butt off? No, prepared to say things that are unpopular. Prepared to raise your hand and keep raising it. I had learned this lesson 
on my own at pages about halfway through where there were things that were clear to me that were going wrong, but I assumed everyone else knew it was, was dealing with that. And when I, when I finally spoke up and started raising it, I realized everyone was just sort of trying to keep their head down and ignore it. And so I learned how to, that's, that's where I learned to stand up and wave my hands. And that's why my next job, my first consulting job at Eric, when I saw these risks, these, these, were, not, these were not iffy risks. These were all well documented, clear risks uh, in software projects that were simply being, they, they were either unaware of or they were being ignored. Yes, these risks that you knew were going to happen from experience, or like just not like like reading books such as like a, a lot of experience, a lot of research into failed projects. Okay. Yeah, do you feel like you were let go because you were being the squeaky wheel? Uh, I actually, I think I was let go because I think they realized the project was going to fail, and that was the last thing I was doing any architecture consulting on. And they were paying me in nineteen. 96, 100 bucks an hour, which is pretty pricey. Uh, so, so it was, it was a combination, but we left on good terms. Like I said, uh, let's talk because this will actually only take. Well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we all know how that goes. Oh, no, no. I promise it'll take longer than. I'm uh, trying to figure out where, where I want to get a break. <laughs> yes, or promise under deliver. This is going to take hours, folks. We've <laughs> got three slides. Okay. <laughs> Your next deliverable is creating a requirements document. Hang on. I'm going to save myself some editing. Okay. Your next deliverable is creating a requirements document. Here's my first word up front. It's too early. <laughs> but you have no choice. <laughs> because you're on a tight time frame. You're writing them. Many challenges are requirements. You're writing them before you fully know what you want to build. Once again, back to Arm. A lot of you say, oh, wouldn't this be neat? We want to do Python games. Well, you know, games are hard. What's fun? What's an actual fun game? Now, the advantage of doing, saying we're going we're gonna to make Mario level one, is saying, oh, hey, we already we can play it, we can see what we want, we know how it plays, and so on. And, and then what you run into is all the stuff of, you know, actually a lot of work went behind Mario level one. <laughs> you know, unless you can find real handy libraries or, you know, sort of settle for a real low res uh, user interface, it's like, well, that's kind of tough. You're writing your requirements before you're sure if you know you can build them. Again, that's, that's back to armor. Problem, which is not so much a problem here, is the wrong people are often involved in writing this. Uh, you have requirements that are often written by managers who say, oh, we can make a million dollars if we wrote this program. It's like, okay, first off, here's the competition that's already done this and done it better than we're going to do it in any reasonable time frame. Uh, and, you know, here are the things you're asking for that just aren't possible. Uh, you do have the problem of engineers who are more interested in building something cool rather than what the customer will pay for. This is, <laughs> this is a brutal lesson, but it's a true one. This is the classic, oh yeah, this is going to be so cool, it's going to do this, and it's like, yeah, who's going to spend money on it? Uh, or will your, you know, will your end users, if they're in-house, if they're in-house app, will they really like it? Slight diversion here. Actual phrase I have run into multiple times is end users saying, we want the new system to work just like the old system, but better. <laughs> that, that I have run into that exact phrase in that many words, more than once. Uh, people hate change. They complain about what things do, you know, how many of you have upgraded to, to iOS 12? Okay, I haven't yet. Uh, and in fact, I, I can tell you why. Years ago when I, was, I had a column for a while in Macworld called State of the Mac, basically industry uh, analysis and so on. I was at a Macworld Expo, I was speaking with the project manager, product manager for uh, newly released version of the Macintosh operating systems. This is, this is 
way back. This is like 1990, 91. Uh, the old Mac operating system. They were releasing version 7.0. And basically, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him, and he had a slide presentation that was going over all the features and so on, because you know, he wanted me to write about it in Macworld. And when he was all done, he said, what do you think? And I said, I'll tell you what I think. I saw someone yesterday at the expo wearing a t-shirt that said, I'm waiting for system 7.0.1. Uh, and I said, that's my approach. You know, I don't adopt dot zero releases. I probably will not upgrade my iPad and iPhone until it's iOS 12.0.1 at least, and given Apple's recent track record, <laughs> probably dot two or dot three. Uh, but every time they change stuff, and it's like, why did they change that? The old way worked just fine. You're making things more difficult to me now. And of course, you have marketers who want the impossible. Uh, which of course is the, the classic thing. I have I have yelled at marketing people in, in my own company before. Uh, you promised them what? We can't do that. We literally cannot do that, Rian. Why did you tell them we could give them that feature? You have the issue of customers who usually don't know what they really want until they see something working. This is a product, this this is why Agile. One of the big thrusts in Agile is get in front of the customers as soon as possible. Uh, because one of the hardest things to do is to spend, you know, six to 12 months working on something, put it from the customer. The customer says, oh, that sucks. That's not really what I was expecting. You want that feedback as quickly as possible. We will talk more about this. Simple requirements. Your, your requirements document is going to be pretty simple and straightforward at this point, this week. What you'll find is when you go to implement, you're going to have a requirements explosion. Well, we're, if we're implementing this, then we have to have this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this has to work, and this has to do this, and this has to do this in this time frame. Uh, failure to formally manage requirements leads to massive scope creep. This is like, oh! I, there, there's an article, in fact, I think I, I may have it posted. Uh, on the class website, the last page has got, it's got the extra credit books that you can read, and below that, it's just got articles that I post there. And I think I've posted there, if not, I should dig it up and post it there, on how for programmers, just is a four-letter word. Oh, we just want you to add this. <laughs> Can't you just make it work this way? Uh, and part of the problem is, depending on what they're asking, and, and this is, and, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how many of you experience this. You've got something working. Someone says, boy, could you make it do X? And you start, yeah, yeah. I mean, make a few changes and bam, it works. And they're like, whoa, that's so cool. They say, can you make it do Y? And you say, no. <laughs> Can't do it. It would, it would take me three weeks <laughs> of constant work. Well, why? You, you just did X in like 30 seconds. How come you can't do Y? Well, it's completely different. There, it gets back to the visibility problem in software. You know what you can do easily and what is going to require a massive rewrite or extension or whatever. But users can't see that. Managers can't see that. And it can be very hard convincing them why that is. Uh, you have <coughs> strengths and weaknesses in both waterfallish like and agile-like approaches. Uh, the classic waterfall problem is analysis paralysis. You just you never get off analyzing the problem. Uh, you keep revisiting it and reworking the requirements and saying, oh, we've got this, or we've got to do this, we've got to do this. It's like, just build something. Then figure it out. The problem with Agile that I've observed, if you think of your solution space as a 2D plane, and you have various solutions of different heights, where the height represents the desirability of the solution, the broadness of its application. The problem with an Agile approach is if you start here, for example, and you're, you're working towards what is working better, you can work your way up a local 
maximum, that's not the ideal solution. And that you can get you can get stuck there, and when what you really end up having to do is to abandon this hill and go and check the other ones. A waterfall approach conceptually is more like what is the full set of solutions we can work at and what architecture allows us to pick what is the maximum solution here. <coughs> so there are strengths and weaknesses to both approaches. Now, <coughs> your goal is to do the requirements that form the project baseline that defines what you're building. Uh, Eric, remember I told you about Eric? When I, when I came in there, their, their immediate problem was that they were delivering, they were doing the network management subsystem for the Iridium satellite project. There were about a dozen subcontractors. And Motorola was, was the major one. Eric was one of the subcontractors. And they were all, all on the schedule. And Eric was, had, gotten, had a disastrous design review. I was brought in for technical reasons. Bob Millar, who I became good friends with from Motorola, came in for management purposes. And very, he and I started at Eric on the same day. He came in once a week. I was there full time. But we're in a meeting. We're, we're in a conference room with all the project leads from Eric. And he says, where is your baseline documentation? And I'll sort of look at each other. And he said, where, where's, where is your documentation to describe what you're actually building? And he said, well, we sort of have this and sort of have this and sort of that. He says, if you don't have a baseline, if you don't know what you're building, how do you know when you're done? Uh, and he basically kept their feet to the fire week after week until about four or five weeks in, they had a box with three or four binders. That was their baseline documentation. One of the things I'm proudest of is that he and I started at the same time. The next delivery date was at the end of October. Eric was the only contractor or subcontractor who got their bill delivered on time. Everyone else was late. We got ours done. <clears throat> Be sure to watch. I just recommend watching Chuck's uh, podcast on software requirements. It's important to identify what you are not building. We'll do a roll after the break. Uh, actually, well, actually, we'll probably be rolling and take a break because everyone's going to be filling the hallways real quick. So let me finish up here. At Pages, once we closed on venture funding, got our permanent CEO, Larry Spellhog, uh, who had worked on the, uh, been the project manager for uh, Xerox Ventura, which was their, Xerox's desktop publishing system. One of the things he made us do was build the spreadsheet of possible <coughs> features in a desktop publishing system. We had over 600 features. And we got these by basically looking at every single desktop publishing and we're processing a piece of software out there. So we had the spreadsheet with 600 features and what we then did was a process of going through and classifying them in three ways. Here's what we want in version 1.0. Here's what we want in a later version, and here's what we're never going to try and do. And that was very important and very explicit because that way we knew what we were not building. And that was a very handy way to keep developers from going off and saying, oh, well, this would be cool. Won't they be surprised when they see what I've put in here? <laughs> no, don't do that. Now, I've, I've told you that you know, we were a year late in shipping, which, which was agonizing. Here's you know, fake praise, but here is one of the advantages. We had actually completed the user manual uh, about on what the original ship date was. So it was a full year before random shipping. We had, we had completed the user manual. I should bring it in. Nice three ring binder, glossy color, so on, showing everything. And Larry did one of the best things he could do. He, he got like 20 copies of that and he handed it to all the developers, all the QA types, and said, that's what we're building. If it's not in the manual, do not build it. <laughs> if it is in the manual, it has to work the way we're describing it. We have all these manuals. <laughs> but if it's not in the manual, don't build it. And that was actually a very effective way of limiting scope creep. For this class, you'll want to keep your requirements, at least your initial ones, lightweight. 
here's what you need to do. You will do two demos of your software in Clash. You'll do one, yes? So how often should you change the documentation? Uh, as often as you need to to constrain what you're doing and as you discover new requirements that are coming a long way. Now this, this raises a key issue is, are we spending too much time changing documentation as, exactly, as opposed to building stuff? If you think of your requirements as setting bounds as to what you're building, you should change it any time those boundaries change. If you add features or drop features, you should update the documentation. You don't have to sit and describe every detail of what the software is doing. What you're describing is here are the features. And frankly, it's often very useful to simply take at least to take a interface approach, user interface, interfaces between subsystems, you know, front end, back end, so on and so forth. Uh, again, tight coupling within a given subsystem, loose cohesion. Uh, between between subsystems and between the system and the user. You're going to do two demos of whatever you have working. One will be the Monday before the midterms. <coughs> I put it there November 12th. The other will be the last day of class, December 10th. My recommendation is that you sit down as a team and decide what you want to show each of those two dates and write your requirements accordingly. Now is a good time to start throwing out features. <laughs> I, I say that with all seriousness. Now is a good time to say, you know, November 12th, this is October 1st. <laughs> That's like six weeks from now. What can we actually show six weeks from now? Uh, and Focus on what you can show six weeks from now, and then you've got another four weeks from November 12th to December 10th. And say, and this is what we'll do between November 10th and December, November 12th and December 10th. So keep that very much in mind. That will there's there's nothing wrong with scaling back what you're trying to do significantly. There's nothing wrong with having nothing more than a prototype even by December 10th. Again. You're not going to be graded on how well your code works. But I do expect you to have something that you can put up on the screen on each of those two days. Uh, and again, as, as per your two comments, you need to be revising this document as you scale things back. So I would suggest that you prioritize whatever features you come up with now. Describe what you want to have in November. Describe what you want to have in December. Describe the features, and then prioritize those features and say, "This, these are the, this is the order in which we are going to drop features <laughs> as we consider it necessary." Any questions there? Let me call roll here, real quick. For those of you who weren't here last week, everyone got a freebie because I forgot to call roll. <laughs> Uh, Dylan Aston here. Max Bassett here. Abram Beezer here. Samuel Beckett here. Justin Banky here. Brandon Bingham here. Michael Boyd. And I, I have a number of people who are absent for various reasons. Christopher Bradshaw here. Tyler Brady. Let me find something I can put under this. Okay. Stephanie Brown. Here. Justin Brunner. Arthur Buck. Here. And I apologize because this doesn't have preferred names on this roll. Britton Bunn. Here. Joshua Campbell. Here. Pauline Kaus. Here. Kaus Kaus here. I go through that every time. Autumn Chapman. Here. Maxwell Clemens. Here. David Corey. Here. Stephen Cowley. Here. Tanner Craner. Here. Michael Crowther. Michael Team. Benjamin Davis. Here. Jay Davis. Here. Brandon Durbage. Here. Jacob Easley. Here. Justin Egbert. Here. Jordan Farrell. Trent Fulton. Here. Brandon Fry. Here. 
Michael Gardner. Here. Andrew Gill. Here. Robert Grant. Here. Benjamin Guthrie. He's sick. Kip Hacking. Here. Robert Hanna. Here. Allie Harrison. Here. Call this one, are you? <laughs> I'm flattered. I'm flattered we have this many people. Jared Havlin. Here. Elena Heaton. Here. Jonah Henderson. Here. Connor Hewitt. Here. Rebecca Hill. Here. Eric Holm. Here. Phil Horton. Here. Jacob Huffaker. Here. Austin Wayne. Here. Jessica Jameson. Uh, yes, yes. Seth Johnson. Here. Jeremy Key. Here. McKay Kirksey. Here. Kirksey? Kirksey. Clayton Kingsbury. Here. Quan Co. Here. Chuan Feng Lee. Chuan Feng? Here. Oh, here. Okay. You were in his page. Michael Lil. Here. Samuel Lister. Here. Kyle March. Here. Jonathan Ming. Here. Tyler Mercer. Jacob McAllis. Here. Brendan Mitchell. Here. Alex Muffin? Here. You go by Alex? I go by Xander. Zan oh, Xander. Oh, you're. Oh, there we go. Xander. Uh, Kayla Nelson. Present. Curtis Oakley. Here. Matthew Alderson. Matthew? Andrew Olson. Here. Ryan Ott. Here. Ott or Ott? Ott. Ott. Brandon Patrick. Here. Ryan Kempler. Here. Everett Cortella. Everett. Jason Rodriguez. Jason? Isaac Sampson. Well, oh, three in a row. Joshua Stevens. Here. Ryan Struthers. Here. Almost there. Okay, Charles Tolley. Here. Allison Walk. Here. Walk or Walk? Walk. Okay. Dustin Watkins. Here. Thomas Whitney. Here. Garrett Wilhelm. Here. Alexander Wilson. Here. And Benjamin Ward. Walter. Here. Okay, 10 minute break. Let's meet back here at 10 after. And we'll go over uh, Brooks and Webster.